طيب السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين So we'll continue inshallah today with our uh, the same subject that we dealt with last week which is the slander of Aisha radiallahu anha and it is a difficult family issue a family issue that took place within the family of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, he was directly concerned with it his wife was involved, people were talking about his wife so it is a very difficult matter that Rasulullah sallallahu had to deal with it Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, his best friend and he's uh, the, father, the father of his beloved wife Aisha radiallahu anha so all of these people were involved in this issue we need to learn from them observe their behavior and also learn from the feedback that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them about this incident. And it is in Surah An-Nur. And it is very beneficial, extremely beneficial to go through this ayat and learn from this methodology. Actually, there is a clear methodology that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is laying down here for the believers to follow and learn from and actually act upon when there are rumors, when the people are spreading some news in the community. How do you deal with this news? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us about the, base, the best behavior and warning us against you know, any mischievous behavior or any you know, mistakes in this, in this regard. So as I said, the, the story started with ayah 11 in, in Surah An-Nur. And in this ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ جَاءُوا بِالْإِفْكِ عُصْبَةٌ مِّنْكُمْ so in the first part of this ayah, indeed those who came with this falsehood are a group among you. And we talked about it, we mentioned their names, the names of the believers, and we mentioned the name of the head of the munafiqeen, the hypocrites. There are maybe, there could be some other people, uh, members of you know, his close circles who were talking about it, but the Quran did not mention any name. So we found about these names in the Sunnah, in the Hadith that are found in Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. And the first part of this ayah, we talked about it last time. The second part here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, لا تحسبوه شرا لكم بل هو خير لكم. He said, do not think it bad for you, rather it is good for you. And it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is saying here, you know, don't have uh, you know, a wrong perception about this incident and this story. This is something good, it has many benefits. So now what are the benefits that are related to the slender incident? And this is what something that we need to focus on it. And inshallah we will strengthen our iman and faith in the mission of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by looking into these benefits. The first benefit, and I believe this is the most important thing, Beside the other benefits, مثلاً, the purity and the innocence of Aisha radiallahu anha and the guidance that we got from, Rasulullah, uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regarding this kind of incident, the first benefit is our knowledge about the personality of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Our knowledge, we increase our knowledge, we learn about him, we learn more about him alayhi salatu wa sallam. And there are three points that we need to pay attention to. The first point is that he was a human being who had no absolute knowledge about the unseen, ilm al ghayb. Yani he was a human being because we know through this story, when we study this story, he was confused, he didn't know what to do. He was consulting, talking to the other wives, Mathanan Zainab, uh, talking to Ali and Usama, or asking the, the servant, the female servant, Barira. So he didn't know the unseen. And the ulama, they said, had he, uh, had he known the unseen, he wouldn't have felt so upset or, or made inquiries or count, nor counseled repentance from Aisha radiallahu anha. So it is clear that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam does not know the unseen except what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught him. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had taught him. And this is something that is, should be clear in the mind of every Muslim. Why? Because this is another problem that, you know, uh, that, that took place. Attributing throughout our history as Muslims, we had different groups who attributed, you know, this quality of knowing the unseen to the religious leaders. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through this incident 
is protecting the religion against these exaggerated notions about religious leaders. If Rasulullah himself, who was the best of all prophets and messengers, did not have access to the unseen, ilm al ghayr then how about the other people who are less than him in ranking and status? But yet we have groups of this ummah who attributed this quality to their leaders. Groups, different sects and different groups who believe, used to believe that their religious leaders have access to the unseen and they know ilm al ghayb So this is number one. Number two, he was a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we are very confident about it and this is a proof that he was a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was not, he was not, وَلَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ He did not speak from his own desire, alayhi salatu wassalam. Had he been a fabricator, he would have just fabricated some verses from the Qur'an to protect his honor and the honor of his wife, right? Because now what you need to study, to, to look at the situation from this angle. We have Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, who is upset with the presence of Rasulullah in Medina and his leadership. So he's, he thought that Rasulullah was competing with him. Rasulullah came to, to the Medina to take from him this position of leadership, right? And that's why he's trying to destroy the, the reputation of our Prophet in any way or shape, right? He's trying his best. But Rasulullah, if he was a fabricator, he's been fabricated Quran for the last 18 years, if he was a fabricator, right? Because he spent 13 years in Mecca and now 5 years in Medina. So he had experience, he's well, he's well skilled now in fabricating verses of the Quran, telling people this is this is Quran, these are the words of God, right? So it would be easy for him to fabricate some verses from day one and protect his honor and the honor of his family. But Rasulullah couldn't do anything about it. And he was confused like any other human being, like any other husband who didn't, have, who didn't know what to do. And he started you know, consulting people and talking to them about this situation. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, made him wait for w one complete month before he received, you know, revelation about the truth and about what happened, uh, you know, in this situation. The third, you know, piece of knowledge about our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that this incident, ya ikhwan, proved beyond any doubt the, the, the greatness of his character, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the nobility of his manners. So his, in, his justice and his fairness and his tolerance were known to every wise person. Here there is another incident that took place within this whole big story. There is an amazing incident that took place. What is amazing about it is the reaction of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What happened is, Hassan ibn Thabit, we know, the poet, was involved, radiyallahu anhu, was involved. Of course, we know, we say always, radiyallahu anhum, because we need to respect the Sahaba. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in the Quran that he was pleased with them. Now, how, do, how uh, should we look at their mistakes? They were new Muslims, they were learning, they made mistakes like every human being, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven their mistakes. So it's not up to us to judge them or have any bad opinion about the Sahaba of Rasulullah Sallallahu If you expect them to be like angels, angels, then we are exaggerating. If Rasulullah Sallallahu himself, we know that he made some mistakes when it comes to dealing with Al-A'ma, in Surah Al Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Kutum, in Surah Abasa, or he made some miscalculations, not sins. How about the Sahaba radiyallahu anhu who were not prophets and were not messengers? They are not infallible. So we have to treat them with respect because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran told us that he was pleased with their achievements. He was pleased with their contribution. He didn't tell us that they are angels. If they were angels, we cannot take them as role models. Because we would say, they are angels, they are protected from committing sins. So, so we cannot compare ourselves with them, to them, right? And their, their stories and their life will be irrelevant. It will have no relevance to our life. And to our, pro uh, and to our uh, issues and problems. But now they are hujja against us. They are a proof against us on the Day of Judgment because they were human beings like us. They used to eat and drink and make mistakes and they get married, have children. Human beings, normal human beings. And yet they were able to achieve 
these great results that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was pleased with. You know, they were able to spread the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to pass the message, to convey the message of Islam to uh, the, the next generations. So here, uh, when I talk about the mistakes of Hassan ibn Thabit, I have to still, you know, show him respect, radiyallahu anhu. So what happened? We know that he was involved in the spreading of this news. And Safwan ibn al-Mu'attal, of course, is involved. It is the center of this story. He's the one who brought Aisha radiyallahu anha on his, on his uh, camel. And he was, he was a poet too. He was a poet, Safwan ibn Mu'attal. But you know, the, the skills of Hassan ibn Thabit are better than the skills of Safwan ibn Mu'attal. So what happened? Safwan ibn Mu'attal decided to take revenge against him. He decided to take matters into his own hands. Safwan ibn Mu'attal radiallahu anhu, I don't blame him. He was upset, but that was his ishtihad. He decided to take matters into his own hands. He hid himself to Hassan ibn Thabit one night, for Hassan ibn Thabit one night, and when he came close to him, he hit him with the handle of his sword. And then when he hit him with the, when doing this, he said some, uh, he said some poetry that is found in uh, some books of history, Ustil Ghaba and Ma'rifat al-Sahaba. He said, Talaqa dhubaba sayfi minni. فَإِنَّنِي غُلَامٌ إِذَا هُجِيتُ لَسْتُ بِشَاعِرِي وَلَكِنِّي أَحْمِي حِمَايَ وَأَشْتَفِي مِنَ الْبَاهِتِ الرَّامِ الْبَرَاءِ الطَّوَاهِرِ So basically, you know, when he translated, you know, this is a beautiful poetry, but when it is translated, it loses its, uh, its beauty. So he said, تَلَقَّ ذُبَابَ السَّيْفِ مِنِّي Receive from me the handle of the sword. You know, he, he didn't want to hit him with the sword, otherwise he would have killed him. So he hit him with the handle of his sword. تَلَقَّ ذُبَابَ السَّيْفِ مِنِّي فَإِنِّي فَإِنَّنِي غُلَامًا For I am a young man. When I am attacked, I forget about poetry. I am not a poet anymore. I become violent. <laughs> that is his poetry here, Safwan ibn Mu'attal. وَلَكِنَّنِي أَحْمِي حِمَايَ وَأَشْتَفِي I am only protecting my honor and my dignity, taking revenge against the one who attacked innocent people. So Hassan ibn Thabit, what happened? Screamed, and people came to his rescue. Safwan ibn Ma'attar radiallahu anhu left the scene of this incident. He ran away. So he fled the scene. Later on, what happened is something amazing will happen. Hassan ibn Thabit, who talked about this man, and he talked about Aisha, went to the messenger of Allah complaining about what Safwan ibn Ma'attar did. And here you will see the ultimate justice. Something amazing, something that is mind-blowing. You know, coming to Rasulullah, you attacked his wife, you talked about his wife. And yet you have the courage, you had the courage to go and talk to him about it, like you are the victim. But he was a victim in this incident. Because Zafwan was not supposed to take matters into his own hands. So Rasulullah Wasallam here, he, he dealt with this second incident that is related to the first one with complete separation. Yeah, and he was able to disconnect between the two. There was no ego here. Yes, he is involved, his honor is involved, his reputation is involved, but justice has to be served. Because Safwan was not uh, supposed to take matters into his own hands. We're waiting, Rasulullah was waiting for the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this shows his ubudiyya to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His complete servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He couldn't do anything about it, waiting for the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to come. To, to come down and to tell them what to do. So here, Rasulullah you know, is representing the legal system of justice. So that's why Hassan ibn Thabit had to go back to Rasulullah sallallahu And Rasulullah sallallahu has to be neutral because he is the judge in that community. He's representing what? The legal system of justice. Uh, so he had to deal with it. Even though his honor and his reputation and the, and the honor of his family are involved, but yet Rasulullah sallallahu did not allow 
himself to follow you know any form of ego in that in that matter what happened is he asked Hassan to forgive Safwan and he took it upon himself he said I will deal with it I will pay you back on behalf of Safwan so what did he do he gave him a garden a garden in the city of Medina and allowed him to get married with Sirin Sirin she was the 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 the, the she was the sister of Mary al Qibtiya. Mary al Qibtiya, one of the wives of Rasulullah, she was an Egyptian, and her sister is Sirin. She, uh, she became later on, after this incident, a wife of Hassan ibn Thabit. And this story, as I said, I, as I told you, is it is, it is mentioned in Kitab Usd al Ghaba. It was authored by Ibn al Athir and Ma'rifat al Sahaba li Abi Nu'aym al Asbahani. It's a beautiful story that shows. The, the, the level of justice in that community. You cannot allow your emotions to interfere when you are a judge. That's why Rasulullah he said, لا يقضي القاضي وهو غضبان لا يقضي القاضي وهو جوعان He said a judge should not make any judgment when he is hungry. When you are hungry, you think about food. And you are in front of you two people, you are dealing with a dispute. Two people who are you know, having a disagreement and you need to serve, justice needs, needs to be served. So if you are a judge and you're missing your cup of coffee in the morning, you're thinking about your breakfast, eh, maybe your judgment will be affected by your, the state of your mind and your, uh, you know, your psychological state. And A judge should not make any judgment when he's angry. So you have to remove all these external factors. Try to protect the case you are dealing with from any external factor that might affect the judgment of a judge. Some other benefits, the Muslim community here received a clear guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about the danger of spreading rumors, false accusations against innocent people. Uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed us the way the best way to deal with this incident and these problems when they arise in the community. And he said, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically saying if someone accuses someone else by, you know, with this kind of illegal act or with this sin, then he, had to, he has to provide four witnesses. Otherwise it is a crime and he will bear, you know, the consequences of this crime. But before that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us about some other etiquette, some other, you know, uh, manners that we have to observe when dealing with this. Even if we are not in, in a position of authority, you are not a judge, you are not directly involved, you are an outsider, there are some manners that you need to observe as a Muslim when these rumors are being spread in the community. And this is clearly mentioned in Surah al uh, in Surah al Nur. We will go through this, inshallah. We will know the importance of this uh, today, bithnillah ta'ala. The importance of these manners. The other lesson or the benefit, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed them the dangers of hypocrisy. That it is a very, these people are very dangerous because they are members of the community. They live with the community, they come to the same masajid. They were, uh, you know, fasting in Ramadan, they were praying with them, with the rest of Muslims. So Muslims will pay by learning, by going through this ordeal, this kind of ordeal. They will learn, you know, about their tools and their ways of creating fitna and dissemination in the community. Yeah, and of course it is a very difficult matter to label people with nifaq, with hypocrisy, especially with major nifaq. But this is a lesson that we learn beside other lessons that were mentioned in the Quran about the behavior of this group of people uh, that are called hypocrites or munafiqeen. Someone might ask, you know, a question, you know, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is really revealing some ahkam, some guidance here about the best way to deal with this kind of problems. Someone might ask, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose to make the Muslim community to go through this pain? He could just have, he could have just revealed these rules and guidelines, you know, without, you know, uh, without stories, without these painful stories. So what is the hikmah, ya ikhwan? The ulama, they said the hikmah is, uh, you know, 
people, if, if these rules and these guidelines were revealed without any painful stories, people will not appreciate the importance of these etiquettes and these manners and these rules. Why? Because we only appreciate the power and the benefit of a medication after we get sick. If you don't get sick, if you are healthy, and you bring me, if I'm healthy, and I, you bring me a, a type of medication, and you tell me, you keep telling me about the importance and the power of this medication, I will never appreciate the power of this medication unless I get sick and I use it. I use it, I get well, then I say, I know, yeah, I, I, I believe what you are saying now. I know this is a very powerful medication. So you only appreciate the power of this uh, these rules and these guidelines when we go through a painful story. So people will be paying attention. People will be waiting for a relief. And relief came to them after one month through these verses of Surah An-Nur. So what will be the reaction of the believers? They will embrace this, this guidance. Because it's, it relieved them from a big, big problem. You know, the, the honor of their own prophet is attacked. So uh, people are, you know, the target, the, the aim or the goal of these uh, hypocrites was the dis dis destroying the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when you destroy the reputation of the messenger and his family, then you'll have doubt about his message, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is protecting his message, uh, the message of uh, Islam, protecting the reputation, the honor of his prophet and the people around him by revealing this ayat. Yet it was a painful you know, experience, so they had to go through, through, through this painful experience to appreciate the power of these, uh, this guidance that is found in Surah Nur. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically said, لا تحسبوه شرا لكم بل هو خير لكم Do not think it's something bad, rather it is good because there are many lessons, wonderful lessons that to be learned there. And then the next part of the ayah, he said, مِنْهُمْ مَكْتَسَبَ مِنَ الْإِثْمِ To everyone among them will come the punishment of the sin that he earned. We know that three people were punished in this dunya, were flogged, and we mentioned their names last time. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at the end of this ayah, he said, وَالَّذِي تَوَلَّ كِبْرَهُ مِنْهُمْ لَهُ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ Aisha, يعني, and to him who took on himself the lead among them, in this story or in this uh, you know, event will have a, a severe punishment on the Day of Judgment. Aisha herself, she said later on, she was related this story and it is found in, in Sahih al-Bukhari through different chain of narrations. She said that he was, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala meant in this part of Ayah 11, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, the leader of the Munafiqeen. Wallahu ta'ala alam. And she clearly mentioned his name as I said, in Surah uh, in uh, Sahih al-Bukhari. The next ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, لَوْلَا إِذْ سَمِعْتُمُوهُ ظَنَّ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتُ بِأَنفُسِهِمْ خَيْرًا وَقَالُوا هَذَا إِفْكٌ مُبِينٌ This is ayah 12. So the next ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us about, before talking about ruling, about you know legal rules regarding this specific matter, he's telling us about the behavior the, the talking, discussing now the best behavior of the mu'mineen. is telling, you were supposed to do this. Why, when you heard it, didn't the believers among men and women think good of one another? Thinking good about one another. And say this is an obvious you know, lie, an obvious fa fabrication, an obvious you know, falsehood. That should be the behavior of the believers. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ya akhwan, this guidance is so beautiful. And it is a message, of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this ayah is dealing with the, the, the incident, that specific incident. But I, will, I don't want you to keep thinking about that incident. This is a reminder to all believers at all times. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayat is protecting the honor and the dignity of all believers. Every member of this community. Every believing man or woman deserves, if he's known for his taqwa and his iman, deserves this treatment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about in this ayah. So this ayah basically is talking about the first line of defense. Yani this is, our, uh, this is uh, the first line of defense in our 
immune system as a community against the viruses of you know, rumors and, and false accusations. Before we talk about you know, judgments and going to the court and dealing with legal issues, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling upon the believers to these, use this common sense and these good manners that when you receive something like that, the first thing you should do, if you know that this person is a mu'min, eh? and by the way, yani, uh, in our communities at all times, this problem is there. People talk about other people. People talk about private matters of other people. People talk about, you know, difficult, sensitive issues happening within families. Other families talking about other families. This is something that is very common, ya khwan. And this is, every believer has to pay attention to the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah An-Nur here. Let's forget about now what happened to Aisha radiallahu anha and, and think about ourselves now and our, our life in the community. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying when you hear about something like this, about another believer, now we're not talking about Aisha, this should be your behavior. You know that he's a good man or she's a good woman. So you should have a good opinion from day one about him or about her. This is called husn al -dhan. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically is inviting the Muslim community or the believers to build a culture of empathy. What is empathy? You put yourself in his shoes or her shoes before you say anything. If you were in his place or her place, would you be happy if people would be talking about you and discussing your private affairs or private matters? Of course you won't be happy. You don't want people to talk about, the, you know, if someone, and these things are happening all the time. If someone had some issues with his children, or his wife, or his sister, or his, any issue, any private matter happening within a family. Of course, no one will be happy to hear that other people are talking about his own family. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is inviting the believers to build this culture of empathy, shafaqa. Have shafaqa, think about them before you say anything. And, uh, and one of the lessons that I learned, this is something personal, not from the Qur'an, but something that I have seen it happening, and I believe in it. I don't have a hadith about it, I don't have an ayah, but I have seen it, I know it, through different incidents. Of course, I cannot give you the details here, because people, when they come to us and they talk to us, we are in a position of trust. So we cannot give details. But I have seen people being punished because they talked about private matters of other people. And the other, one family talking about some issues that took place in one family. After a couple of months, this family had the same issue. And this is something that I had seen it in many cases. And it's very dangerous. So before you talk about private matters of other people, think about your family. Your, your house is made of glass. Don't throw stones at other people. Your house is made of a glass because you are a human being and you have children. If you, the best way to protect your children, protect your family, is that you protect the honor of other Muslims. Protect the honor for other Muslims. And, I, uh, uh, and uh, you know, this is one of the lessons that, alhamdulillah, I believe this is one of the beautiful lessons that I learned in my life. That instead of looking for the mistakes of other people, or criticize what's going on in our community or our ummah, sometimes we talk, we are humans, and we talk, we, we, we feel bad about what's going on in the community or within the ummah in general. Uh, for example, you go to Hajj or Umrah, and you see Muslims coming from different you know, cultures and different communities and you see things that you are not pleased with. So there you meet people who are educated, people who are not educated, people who you know, they have a different culture than yours. There are people who keep criticizing other Muslims all the time. And I told my, some of them, my, my brothers, maybe we should uh, exchange this, uh, you know, this behavior, this attitude, instead of criticizing all the time, maybe we should be, we should start making dua for Muslims. So whenever you think about criticism, 
exchange it with dua. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help them to raise their children in the best way. Make dua for them. And you know that Rasulullah sallallahu said, Asra'u al-da'awati ijabatan da'watu al-Muslim li akhih al-Muslim bi dhahri al-ghayb. He said, the fastest dua in acceptance is the dua of a Muslim for another Muslim when he's not present, when he's absent. And there is something beautiful about it. There will be an angel, Allah will send an angel to you and he will make dua for you. The angel will be making dua for you. He, uh, the angel will say, وَلَكَ بِالْمِثْلِ And you will get the same. So what do you want more than that? An angel making a dua for you. Asking Allah to bless you with the same thing that you are praying, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give to your brother uh, or, or sister. So anyway, uh, this is the first line of defense. Now what is the next step? Now, you maintain this good opinion about this brother or sister. What is the next step? When talking about the next step, here this is a clear methodology, Ikhwan, that we learned from Surah An-Nur. When talking about the next step, people will be divided into two groups. People will be divided in the community into two groups. The first group of people are those individuals who, ha who are not concerned with this incident. They have nothing to do with it. It's not my family member, and I am not in a position of authority, a judge or a lawyer or an imam to deal with it. And I am not related to this family. So you have nothing to do with it. What is the expected behavior? Is what was described in, 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 uh, in Hadith Rawah Imam Tirmidhi, Hadith Hassan, Min Husni Islam al Mar'i, Tarkuhu Ma La Ya'ni. Rasulullah Sallallahu said in this hadith, part of the perfection of one's Islam is to leave that which does not concern him. Leave it. Don't be concerned with it. It's none of your business. So do you go through the first step which is maintaining a good opinion about that person? Because you don't have a proof, you don't have an evidence, you're not supposed to talk about it. And min husni islam al mar'i tarkuhu ma la ya'ni. You are not concerned with it. You're not part of the story, you're not part of the conflict, you're not part of this disagreement, then you shouldn't be uh, involved in it. And we have, you know, the famous saying, everyone is, everyone is innocent until proven guilty. But ag again, here we add something. It is not my duty, if I'm not concerned with this story, I am not in a position of authority, it is not my duty to prove him innocent or guilty. I maintain this principle here. Everyone is innocent until proven guilty. It's not, and it's not I, and my, my duty as a Muslim based on this guidance from Surah An-Nur to maintain a good opinion about them. This is what I know about them. Uh, he's a good person, he's a, she's a good Muslimah. And it's not my duty to investigate. Mm-hmm. Because there are people who, when they hear a story, they start investigating. This is the mistake that happens in the community, in our community. This is how we spread this. They start investigating and talking. How do you, did you hear what, what happened? Did you hear what other people are saying? And they start talking, looking for proofs. No, it's not your job. It's not your job at all. It's not my job. Unless you are, as I said, in a position of authority, or you are a victim, or you are a family member, who is related to that person and you are concerned about his well-being. So these are the second group of people. The victims of that slander or the, their family members, like here Rasulullah was directly concerned with this from different ways. He was concerned with it as a leader of the community, as a judge. He was in a place of position of authority and he was concerned with it through his relationship to Aisha radiallahu anha. So if someone is in this position, you're directly related to that person, she's your daughter, she's your sister, he's your son, he's your brother, he's your uncle, your father, you're directly, well, then you need to know, you need to help. It's okay if you get involved in it in a positive way. The way Rasulullah was involved in this incident, the way Abu Bakr and his, and his wife. So in this case, when it comes to investigation, this is the second step. The Sharia requires 
regarding this specific problem, not every problem, this specific problem, the Sharia ah requires the testimony of four witnesses. This is the second step. And here we're dealing with a legal issue here. Here it could be a court, a, a case in a court, a legal issue, the judges involved, people in authority, in position of authority should be involved in it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the next ayah, لَوْ لَجَاءُوا عَلَيْهِ بِأَرْبَعَةِ شُهَدَاءِ فَإِذْ لَمْ يَأْتُوا بِالشُهَدَاءِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ هُمُ الْكَاذِبُونَ He said, why did they not produce for it four witnesses? And when they did not bring witnesses, then it is they in the sight of Allah who are the liars. Even if you, the person brings three witnesses, he's still a liar in the sight of Allah. If he brings two witnesses, he's still a liar in the sight of Allah. And it is a crime, and he will face the punishment for this crime. Attacking the slandering or attacking the honor of someone else. So to be, uh, you know, to be relieved or acquitted from this crime, the person has to provide or has to bring four witnesses. And it is something that is difficult sometimes to provide. And look at the beauty of the Sharia. The Sharia is protecting the honor of the members of the Muslim community. If you don't have this proof, which is the testimony of four witnesses, then you cannot uh, you know, say something like that. You cannot be involved in spreading this, this news about people. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the next ayah, وَلَوْلَا فَضْلُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَتُهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ لَمَسَّكُمْ فِي مَا أَفَضْتُمْ فِيهِ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ He said, and if it had not been for the favor of Allah upon you, and His mercy in this world and the hereafter, you would have been touched for that lie in which you were involved by a great punishment. And this is a stern warning from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That it was not, if it was not for his rahmah, for his mercy, you would, be, you would have been punished by a great punishment. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, you know, adhabun azim is not something easy, it's not a joke. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has the power to punish, you know, nations, if he wishes. Kun fayakun, the word be and it will be. And we know what happened to the previous nations, those who disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who perished. In the history, the, some of them are mentioned in the Quran because of their ma'asiyah and their sins. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed nations because of their kufr and disbelief. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here, if it was not for his rahmah, for his mercy upon you as a community, you would have received a great punishment because of this lie. So he's saying this is something, it's not a joke, this is a deadly sin. It might destroy your hasanat, it destroys your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And before it destroys your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, it destroys the relationship between the believers. Because people, when they start talking about these things, but people will not have a great relationship. So basically, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that there is zero tolerance for this kind of behavior. In the second ayah, the next ayah, he said, إِذْ تَلَقَوْنَهُ بِأَلْسِنَتِكُمْ وَتَقُولُونَ بِأَفْوَاهِكُمْ مَا لَيْسَ لَكُمْ بِهِ عِلْمٍ وَتَحْسَبُونَهُ هَيِّنًا وَهُوَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عَظِيمٍ تَلَقَّوْنَهُ بِأَلْسِنَتِكُمْ يعني you receive it with your tongues. وَتَقُولُونَ بِأَفْوَاهِكُمْ مَا لَيْسَ لَكُمْ بِهِ عِلْمٍ Some scholars said, it's like, you know, those who were involved, they did not allow this information to go inside, to absorb it and analyze it and say, oh, this is bad, I'm not supposed to be involved in it. No. What happened is, they received it with their tongues and immediately they flip it over. And they start talking about something which they didn't have knowledge about. And you say with your mouth that which you don't have knowledge about. So if you don't have knowledge about this, how can you, how can you accuse someone who is innocent, who, who is in that you know, position like Aisha, the, the most beloved wife of our Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, the daughter of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, uh, the best man of this ummah after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa How can you do that without verifying this news? Because the only proof they have is that Aisha radiallahu anha was left behind and Safwan ibn Mu'attal brought her on his camel in the morning. You know, this is the only thing. She spent the night by herself 
We know that based on her story in Surah Al in, in Sahih Al Bukhari. He came in the morning and he gave her ride to the camp, from that place to the camp. This is the information that you have. So you cannot build stories on something like that. Yani I'll, I'll give you an example to be more clear. If someone, if someone sees a man coming out from a house with another woman, does he have the right? They are not related. Does he have the right to accuse them of doing something illegal? They're coming out from a house. Huh? You don't have the right, so you cannot build on this what you saw. Yes, it's something that maybe you're not happy with, but who told you that they were alone inside? Maybe there are other people inside, or there may be other cases, other scenarios. You know what I mean? Different, and it's none of your business, and Islamically you don't have the authority to make this kind of accusation by just looking at something like this happening in front of your eyes. So the only thing that they had at that time is that Aisha was left behind and Safwan ibn Mu'attal brought her on his, on his camel radiyallahu anhum ajma'in. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, وَتَقُولُونَ بِأَفْوَاهِكَ When you say something with your mouth which you don't have knowledge about. So if someone does not have knowledge, is not allowed to say, to talk about something, that he, you know, الْقَوْلُ عَلَى اللَّهِ بِغَيْرِ عِلْمِ الْقَوْلُ عَلَى اللَّهِ بِغَيْرِ عِلْمِ هذا مِنَ الْكَبَائِرِ مِنَ الذنوب. والقول على الناس بغير علم أيضا من الكبائر أيضا يعني talking about people without a proof a solid proof is a major sin attacking other people without a solid proof وتحسبونه هينا this is a great lesson here تحسبونه you think that it is insignificant it's easy it's a minor issue تحسبونه هينا وهو عند الله عظيم why it is in the sight of Allah سبحانه وتعالى something great great sin tremendous it's something big. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not a joke. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not tolerate this, you know, this kind of behavior. And I, oh, yani of course, every ma'asiyah is a great sin, but this is, there, are, there is a third party. You know, when we disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when, when I commit a sin between me and Allah and no one is involved, actually it's, uh, it's, uh, it's easier than involving a third person, taking the money, the property of someone else, or attacking the owner of, a, of a, a, you know, someone else. You know, but it, because when you need to make tawbah, making tawbah for this kind of sins is more difficult than making a tawbah, making tawbah or repentance for a sin that involves you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You disobey the lights between you and Allah. You have ikhlas, feel be guilty about it. You'll have a firm, inshallah, deter, uh, will not to do it again in the future. And that's it, and you quit that sin, and your tawbah, your repentance is accepted between you and Allah. When a third party is involved, oh my God, you have to, if it is a property or money, you have to give it back to them. Or if you attack their honor, it, be, it becomes more difficult. The ulama, they said, you have to ask forgiveness from them. Sometimes if you go and talk to them about it, they will become more upset. And it, matters becomes worse. You're trying to solve a problem, you create another problem. So it becomes very complicated when, you're, when my sin or your sin involves a third party. So this is something that we need to pay attention to. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the next ayah, وَلَوْلَا إِذْ سَمِعْتُمُوهُ قُلْتُمْ مَا يَكُونُ لَنَا أَنَّ نَتَكَلَّمَ بِهَذَا سُبْحَانَكَ هَذَا بُهْتَانٌ عَظِيمٌ This ayah is confirming the other ayah which is number 12. That, yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is repeating this behavior, is, uh, this, uh, this guidance here. This reminder that when we hear it, here is saying, why when you heard it, didn't you say, it is not for us to speak of this. Exalted are you, O Allah subhanaka. Hada buhtanun azim. This is a great uh, slander. And here, of course, I mentioned before the behavior of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. And the, the behavior also, or the reaction of Zain, Zainab bin Tujahsh radiallahu anha, the other wife of Rasulullah sallallahu So Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, when his wife told him about it, he said, you know, uh, you know, we are not supposed to talk about this. And then he told his wife, if you were in her place, in the place of Aisha, would you do this? Then she said, no, never. And he said, Aisha is better than you. So having a good opinion about another believer, here is Aisha radiallahu anha. So they were involved in it in a positive way. 
they were defending the honor of their sister who is Aisha radiallahu anha in that position and also the honor of their brother who is Safwan ibn Mu'attil radiallahu anhu. By the way, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said about Safwan, ma alimtu anhu illa khayran. I didn't see, I haven't seen anything except good about this man. And this is a great actually testimony from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of Safwan ibn Mu'attil. This is a great testimony, uh, you know, because it came from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And also the, be, the reaction of Zainab bin Tujahsh, when Rasulullah sallallahu asked Zainab, have you seen anything? Have you noticed anything? Anything that you, you know, are you doubtful about any, you know, any behavior, anything you have seen in the, in the, in the behavior of Aisha radiallahu anha? Qalat, ya Rasulullah, ahmi sam'i wa basari. Her sister was involved in it, but Zainab, she said, Ya Rasulullah, ahmi sam'i wa basari, ma ra'aytu illa khayran. She said, Ya Rasul, O Messenger of Allah, I need to protect my, my hearing. I protect my sight. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching. I haven't seen anything except good from her. Even though Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, she was the one who used to compete. She was her rival to compete with me. You know, we know that there was some sort of competition between Zainab and Aisha. They were co-wives and this is normal, this is natural. Even within the community of the Sahaba and they were wives of the Prophet ﷺ, but this is normal. This is a natural human, uh, be, uh, human uh, behavior. So even though there was some sort of competition, she said, Wara'uha, yani, uh, Aisha, uh, Zainab was protected by her wara. What is wara is taqwa. It's taking, to the, the, taking the safe side, al wara. Wara, when you are in front of you know, two options or two choices and, and there is a shubha, some shubha that is involved, so you take the safe side. The ulama in Arabic call it al wara. Well, it could be the highest level of taqwa, even though you know, wara usually it's ma it is used when talking about another option that could be permissible, but the other one is better. It's safer, al wara. But here Aisha radiallahu anha used this term that Zainab protected herself, protected her deen. Her deen actually, her relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, her taqwa protected her and she didn't say anything wrong. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the next ayah, يَعِذُكُمُ اللَّهُ أَن تَعُودُوا لِمِثْلِهِ أَبَدًا إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Allah warns you against returning to the likes of this conduct ever if you should be believers whenever I read this ayah I think about those who are slandering Aisha radiallahu anha till now I think about those who are talking about attacking the honor and the dignity of our mother and the mother of all believers Aisha radiallahu anha whom every believer is supposed to esteem higher than his own mother Aisha radiallahu anha is better than our own mothers and she is the mother of all believers and yet there are people and umyan al basira as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala al hidayah bi jami' al muslimin so ya'idukum Allah an an ta'udu li mithlihi abadan in kuntum mu'minin Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns you against returning to the likes of this conduct this is a clear you know guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we should never follow the step of shaitan, the steps of shaitan regarding these kind of issues. Not only Aisha radiallahu anha. No, Aisha is mainly concerned here. And no one is supposed to have a bad opinion about Aisha, whether he is a Sunni or Shi'i. All Muslims are supposed to you know, treat Aisha with the highest level of respect. She is the mother of the believers. And these ayats are defending her honor. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took it upon himself to defend her honor. But it is also a reminder to all believers about the honor of their own brothers and sisters in the community. That if someone does not have a solid proof, then he shouldn't spread, he shouldn't say, make, you know, this kind of statement about any believer, any believing man or woman. جزاكم الله خيرا وبارك الله فيكم خيرا سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك اشهد ان لا اله الا انت نستغفرك ونتوب اليك